Good morning, and uh, if, if you weren't here right at the start, it's Palm Sunday today, which is why you might have seen some palm leaves outside, um, it's, uh, and we'll, we'll explain a little bit more about that in a while. But my name's Dan, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we're continuing our Lent season this morning. We are a people that look for signs to tell us the times. We mark all uh, special times with signs. You know, we mark events like birthdays with cakes. We mark relationships with rings and relationship status updates. We, we, we mark achievements with, you know, today is the Grand Prix. One lucky winner will stand at the end with a sign to tell of the time today. We are people that look for signs to tell us the times. But imagine you fell into a deep, Deep, deep sleep. Not now. But, but imagine you fell into a sleep and then you woke up after many, many months. And at the end of your bed, there was a stocking. You would know that sign would tell you the time and you would know that it would be Christmas. Imagine you fell asleep again and you're very tired. You fall asleep again for many months and you wake up and there's an egg. You would know that it was Easter. If there was a pumpkin, you know it was Halloween. And if everything was red, you would know it's Chinese New Year. But imagine you fell into this deep sleep and you woke up after a long time and at the end of your bed you found a stocking filled with red eggs and red pumpkins. You wouldn't know what the times were. The signs wouldn't match the times. They'd be all jumbled together and you'd, you'd assume somebody was trying to make a point. That in a nutshell is what happened on Palm Sunday. We're in a series of, uh, of Lent, uh, 40 days leading up to Easter. We're, we're, we're kind of taking the time to focus on what it means to follow Jesus to the cross, to follow him as his disciple. And uh, our reading for today is Mark chapter 11. You might like to find it in your app or your Bibles or, and it will come up on the screen. But it's Mark chapter 11, starting at verse 1 through to 11. It says this. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. Just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway, and as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing, untying that colt? And they answered, Jesus, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And those went ahead, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple and he looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And we read the next day on reaching Jerusalem, he entered the temple. And as we looked at two weeks ago, he drove out those selling doves and shut the temple down. Jesus arrives in Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. But he arrives at Passover with all the signs and the symbols of Hanukkah. Passover was one of the big festivals. It's kind of like the Chinese New Year in Jerusalem. You know, it's the big, the big festival. It was when they looked back to when God had done something miraculous and had saved them out of slavery, out of Egypt, and brought them towards the promised land. And everyone would go to Jerusalem and they would celebrate it every year with signs, with signs of unleavened bread and with lamb, a meal of lamb. And Jesus arrives for this big festival of Passover with the signs and symbols of the festival of Hanukkah. 
Hanukkah would have been celebrated three months prior and looked back to only kind of 300 years before the time of Jesus. And what it was, it was celebrating a time when Israel was under foreign rule as it was in Jesus' day. And a guy called Judas Maccabeus had kind of got together kind of an army and he had kind of got all of Israel united and they threw off the oppressors. And then he marched into Jerusalem to make it his capital, to be crowned king. And he marched in and as he marched in, they laid their cloaks on the ground and they waved palm branches and they shouted, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And then Judas Maccabeus went up to the temple and he cleansed it and he reinstated the temple. And they celebrated it every year. And foreign rule had come back in and they celebrated it even the more. The time when the true king would come and set them free. And Jesus arrives as if it's Hanukkah. And he brings all the signs and the symbols to Passover. And in doing so, he's making a point. He's saying to all who have ears, these are the signs to tell you that now is the time. And the point he is making is he's saying, I'm coming at Passover. I am your priest to come and deal with your past but I'm also coming as your king to give you a hope for your future. And he collides the two together. And and I've been thinking about this. I've been trying to work out why it is. And I think part of it is when when we mess up, when we sin, we, we come to Jesus and he is our priest and he will forgive us. Complete forgiveness. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. He, He brings complete and utter freedom. But if it's just forgiveness, you can end up in a cycle. You do something, you ask for forgiveness. You do it again, and he forgives you. And you do it again, and he forgives you. And he will forgive you. Jesus will forgive you seven times 77 times 77 billion million times. But if that's all it is, you might miss out on the greatness that he has for you. Jesus comes as a priest and a king. Uh, The forgiveness means you are now free to choose. As you submit your will to Jesus as king, means that you start to make choices that will lead you into greatness. That will lead you down the way that he is leading you the way that he marked out before us, the way to the cross. Now, you might not have woken up this morning thinking, I would love somebody to tell me how to submit my will to another. Um, It's not really kind of something we all kind of desire or long for, maybe. And and that's because whenever you submit yourself to, to anybody else, anything else in this world, submission means losing your freedom. Submission means limiting yourself. But Jesus is the only king that as you submit to him, he makes you freer. He makes you greater. He creates you and makes you to be more as he created and dreamed you could be when he he first dreamt of you before creation. And that's because Jesus is a different kind of king. And we see it in this story. The first thing we see is that Jesus is a a confrontational king. And, you know, all throughout the gospel stories, uh, Jesus is going around and he's doing, for three years, he's ministering. And he does these amazing miracles, amazing signs and wonders. He teaches things that leaves people astonished. And they want to make noise. There's there's one time where they want to set him up as a king and overthrow uh, Rome. And to every time people come to him and say, let's make a lot of noise about it, Jesus' response is to say, shh, don't tell anyone, go home. Let your ordered life confess what God has done in your life. Whenever the crowds form, Jesus seems to slip away and be interested in just the few. And he does that in all the suburbs. But when he comes to the city, he does the reverse, which is kind of the opposite of what I would do. I might have bravado. If I was a leader, I might have bravado when I'm in the provincial towns. But when it comes to the capital, you might tone it down a bit. You might play the political game. But not with Jesus. 
He comes to the capital and he comes with a parade. It's like Broadway on tour. There's people shouting. There's people waving palm branches. He comes and, and you know, he's come to a foreign power's capital and they're proclaiming him to be king. He is a confrontational king. He is not shying away. And what he's doing is he's saying to the powers that be, you've either got to crown me or you've got to kill me. But you have to choose. Jesus is the most humble person that ever walked this earth. But he is not at all modest. Jesus came to the last, the least, and the lost. He didn't come to a palace. He was born in a stable. He spent his time uh, with regular people and not with the rulers of the land. He was humble, but he wasn't modest. He said things like, I created everything you see, everything you don't see. He said, I will judge the living and the dead. He said, kill me, and I will bring myself back to life in three days. He was humble, but he was not at all modest. And he comes into Jerusalem and he says, you've got to crown me or you've got to kill me, but you can't just like me and then wander off. He brings a decision to the doorstep. He's a confrontational king. And he's kind of, it's, it's the same point he's making again. You can't pick and choose. You can't have a little bit, but not the whole thing. It's like, Imagine you invited our vicar, Miles Tomlin, around for dinner, and you'd cooked him nasi lemak, and you'd, cooked, you'd made durian ice cream, his favorite dessert, for, if you ever want to give him anything. And you invite him, and he comes to the door, and you're like, ah, oh, great, come in, Miles, but stay out, Tomlin. You know, come and sit down, Miles, but Tomlin, you, you go away. You can't split somebody up like that. In the same way, Jesus says, you can't say, come and help her, stay out, Lord. Come in, Savior, stay out, King. Jesus is a confrontational King, and He brings a decision to our doorstep. He's also a counterintuitive King. Uh, never, like, we'll have Palm Sunday every year, uh, and many churches will have it every year. Never let the, the weirdness and the humor of it wear out on you. Like, Jesus rides into the city to proclaim, to, to, to crown Himself as King on a donkey. Like, this is a comedy moment. This is comedy gold. The, the word in the Greek is polos. It either means one of three things. Small donkey, baby horse, or little pony. Now, none of those three are good transport options in any scenario. Like, just imagine it. Like, this is a, this is a little donkey. Like, it would have struggled with Jesus' weight. Jesus' feet would have been dragging along the floor. Like, if, he, if he's coming in to make an entrance, he'd have been better to stand up. His head would have been lower than the crowd on this little animal. This is not what leaders do. Can you imagine Braveheart? In the moment, the climax of his speech on the film, you know, they can take away our lives, but not our freedom, but given from a very small donkey. It wouldn't have the same impact. Can you imagine, after Russia annexed the Crimea, Vladimir Putin riding in on a pony to, to declare his victory? This is not what leaders do. So what is he doing? What's his point? We are an Anglican church, and in, in more kind of traditional Anglican worship, um, the, the service would start with people processing in. If you go to a cathedral, you'll see people, people processing. We still do it for weddings and, and funerals, this kind of procession act. And there was a video that went viral a while ago of, of a cathedral in Europe, and uh, the service was about to start, so you have all the clergy in their robes kind of ready to process in. And they, they started to process in, and just out of the crowd at the back stepped a man dressed as Darth Vader from Star Wars with a lightsaber and just joined in the procession and just, and just marched in. And he was kind of, he was taking the mick out of the traditions and it's, it's good to remind ourselves not to take ourselves too seriously. But he was parodying something they knew. And the video went viral. That's what Jesus is doing. He's taking something that every person there would have known, that every person celebrated every year and he turned it up on his head. He says, yes, I am coming as a king, but whereas other kings come to kill and take power, I'm coming to give up my life and to die. 
You know, whereas every other king that has come into every other city and squashed and, and brought in submission and, and just ruined life, Jesus says, I am coming as a king to give life. He's a counterintuitive king. And we come to God with our needs, don't we? Sometimes we kind of get out of our rhythms of prayer and it's, some need comes into our life and it kind of jerks us back into prayer. And, and there often can be this mismatch. The crowds that day were shouting, Hosanna, which means save us. But it literally means save us now. What the crowd thought they needed was instant political liberation. And Jesus says, I'm coming to give you what you actually need, which is reconciliation. Reconciliation with your Father in heaven, that you could have a relationship with the living God, and reconciliation with your neighbor, that, that you can get along in harmony and peace. There's often this mismatch between what we think we need and what God knows we need. Tim Keller, a pastor, says, in nearly every situation, God will give us what we would have asked for if we knew what he knows. The other thing this highlights is the complete worthlessness of human celebrity. You know, the, the crowd was big, but Jerusalem wasn't that big. So those that were in the crowd shouting Hosanna on Monday would have been in the same crowd shouting, crucify him on Friday. Don't spend your, don't give your life chasing the love of the world because the world's la love lasts till Friday if you're fortunate. But God's love lasts through Friday, lasts through the worst thing that we could give to him through Saturday and through the resurrection. And God's love for you lasts forever and ever, and ever, and ever. Jesus is a counterintuitive king. And finally, Jesus is a coming king. You know, the crowd thought that they wanted a Messiah to come and put the world right. But instead, Jesus came to put them right. You know, I had a philosophy teacher and, um, at school, and people always used to say, why doesn't God come and deal with all the evil people? And his kind of stock response would be, well, he's going to. He's going to start tomorrow, and he's going to start with you, uh, which is not the answer we want to hear. We like to think of all of the problems of the world being outside of us, being over there. But Jesus says, actually, the heart of the issue is the matter of the heart, is the that it's us, it's at a core being that there is something that is out of relationship with God and out of relationship with one another and he came to reconcile us. And there's this beautiful picture of Jesus as the coming king in this story. There's this throwaway line that just says, you know, you know go and get a donkey which no one has ever ridden. You don't need to know much about animals to know that you, you can't just ride them. Maybe you tried to ride a cat or a dog as a child. You know, they don't like it. Um, animals can't just be put to work. You can't just ride them. They have to be broken in. You have to break their spirit in order to use them. But, but this little animal that had never been ridden was brought to Jesus and it carried him carried him uphill into Jerusalem through the heat, through the noise of the crowd and it calmly took him and got the job done. This is a picture of what Jesus will do and is doing now as he brings all of creation back into harmony, back into the peace it was created to be, back into the peace of his presence. There's a... Um, there's a, there's a technique for studying kind of stories in the Bible where you, you, you look at the characters and you're trying to identify with yourself and put yourself in their shoes. And as I tried it with this passage, the, um, the character I most identified with uh, was the donkey. And um, I thought, I, I was bound. I was untamed. I was confused. And then Jesus came into my life and he brings peace. And he uses me to bring glory to himself. There's possibly no better picture of the Christian life than that little donkey carrying Jesus into Jerusalem. 
And, and as he arrives, as the coming king gets to Jerusalem, he does what we looked at two weeks ago. He shuts the temple down. Temples exist in all cultures and all times, all places. Sometimes they look like temples. Uh, other times they look like things like universities or shopping malls or fitness centers. But, but it's all the same thing. And, and there's three supposition, presuppositions with a, with a temple. First of all, it tells us that there is a God, there is a divine, there is an other. The second thing it tells us is that we are separated from the divine, from God. We are, we are not in the relationship we are supposed to be. And the third thing it says is that you can't just walk up to the divine and say, hello. You, you can't just walk in. And what a temple says is, is that you build the temple. You find the priest. You bring the sacrifice. You pay the price. Jesus came and he shuts the temple down. And he says, you will no longer meet with God in a place. You will meet with him in a person. And that person is me. I am the temple. I am the priest. I am the sacrifice. And I have paid the price for you. Jesus has done everything to bring us back into relationship. The relationship for which we were created. And which we were intended. With God and with one another. And then by his spirit, he lives in us. He pours his spirit out into us so that we could know God's love for us. He is a king that loves with a passion that will not be put out. And there's a guy who's an evangelist called George Whitfield in the 18th century. And he wrote this in his prayer journey, journal. He said, Last night I was praying and felt the love of God poured into my soul with such immediacy that I could not sleep. I had to ask the Lord to shield me so that I could get some rest. Jesus is a king that loves and loves and loves again. No matter where we go or how far we go, he pursues us with his love. He is a priest that deals with our past and he is a king that comes to give us a future. And there's, there's one story that um, a guy from back, uh, back in the UK that kind of really demonstrated this, holding this together. It's a guy called Robert, and um, Robert's an alcoholic. And he, he's, he's an alcoholic, and he's, uh, for him, he, he can't even have a sip of alcohol. If he, if he has that, it won't just be a sip. He'll, he'll be gone for two weeks. You won't see him. He won't be at work. His life will be a mess. And, and he's been sober for years. And he says most of the time, he finds it quite easy uh, not to drink. But he says there's, there's one time every year that he gets tempted and, um, and it's at Wimbledon. He loves the tennis. He loves going to Wimbledon. And he says everyone's having strawberries and champagne. And it reminds him of when he used to enjoy it. And, he, and so he says every year, he says, I pray to Jesus. And I say, Jesus, could I have a glass of champagne? And what I love about that prayer is that, that Robert gets this priest and king. He gets that Jesus is his priest and has dealt with his past and has forgiven him. So he can talk to him. He can talk to him candidly about his temptations, about his weakness, about his failures, about his past. He can talk to him about his present because Jesus has been through everything that he's been through. But he also gets that Jesus is his king. His life isn't his own. He doesn't just make decisions and then just come back for forgiveness. He, he makes every decision where he can, asking Jesus for permission. Jesus, what do you think about this? What, what do you say? And he says, he always hears the same thing. He says, Jesus, can I have a glass of champagne? And he says, he always hears back, Robert, you're worth more than that. Robert, you're worth more than that. Jesus is a king, but he is not like other kings. And as we follow him, he gives us the strength. He deals with our past. He sets us free to follow him. And he gives us the strength. And as we follow, we become who we were created to be. We experience life in all of its fullness as we follow him to the cross. Why don't we stand to pray?